I knew, I knew it was bad. I heard the sirens all night long. It was worse than bad. 300 people with nothing to begin with completely wiped out. Early Sunday, I hear they're taking donations over at the school. The school is the connective tissue between my street and the low-cost housing apartments just east, one of which burned down in this fire. I go to my closet, and anything I haven't had on in the last year goes in the box. The school cafeteria is chaos. I look at my box, and I wonder, how is a size 6 woman going to even know to take it? So I borrow a marker, and I'm marking what's inside. And I hear over my shoulder, just put down your box and go. It's the agency guy. Boy, is he frazzled. Maybe he thinks I'm there to steal. Do you want me to start marking the boxes, the contents? It hasn't occurred to anybody that things have to be labeled. So I take the pen and I'm marking and I'm separating and I'm boxing. And the boxes keep coming. After a while, I see that somebody is helping me. She's younger and faster, and she's not boxing. She's unboxing. She's making little outfits along the cafeteria table. The empty boxes are piling up. What are you doing? The people, she says. The people will use an empty box when they make their selections. If we pre-box everything, the people will end up with things they don't need. She's holding the box that I brought. She reaches in and she pulls out a nightgown from my friskier days, holds it up and says, ooh la la, why do you suppose she gave this up? Ooh la la. I don't admit that I am the she who gave it up and the she who gave it up gave it up because she has no current use for it. What I say is, she probably wanted somebody to be happy, a little joy in the midst of all this sorrow. Besides, none of these donations are throwaways. A donation should hurt a little, or it isn't really generous, don't you think? For some reason, this makes her really happy, and she shakes my hand and tells me her name, and I tell her my name, and that's all of the conversation I remember, but something of consequence might have happened or must have happened because of what happens three days later. The agency guy calls me. Can you come in? There's something we want to talk to you about. I hope that they don't think I stole. If they think I stole, I'm not going to be able to convince them that I didn't. He doesn't think I stole. As a matter of fact, I have been vetted thoroughly. They want me to take Sophia. Who? Just for a little while, kind of a, a foster thing, until her mother can finish her classes and find a new apartment. Who? You know, her mother, Dolly, the woman you helped with the boxes. The woman I help. Never mind. This is the last thing I thought. I mean, I, I've thought about it. Who hasn't thought about it? But my life is a mess. I don't even know if I like living in a house or tending a vegetable garden. I, I don't know if I'm staying. But what I hear myself say is, how old is she? I vaguely hear his responses, eight School in the neighborhood lost everything in the fire. What I'm doing, instead of listening, is mentally carving up my house, making room for Sophia. She can have the room next to mine. I'll move my office down to the basement. I'm going to need some help with the bookshelves, though. And that's what I think the agency people are there for when they come to the house, to help me move the bookshelves down to the basement. But no... They're there to check on smoke detectors and whatever. Dolly brings Sophia down to the agency office. I come in, 
Dolly and I chat like we actually know each other. Hi, how are you doing? I'm so glad I could help. This all for Sophia, who doesn't look up. I've been told her eyes are blue, but I don't see her face, so I don't know. I am very nervous when I go back three days later to pick her up. Who knows what goes through somebody else's head, particularly when somebody else is eight. She stands next to the car, not looking at me. I mean, why should she look at me? All her whole life, all she's heard is, don't get into a car with a stranger. Let, let's go for a walk. We'll walk for a little while before we go. She's looking at her bag in the back seat. It's a bag, her bag. It, it's okay, I'll lock it. She doesn't think so. I look in the bag and I see this stuffed toy and I think, well, maybe that's what she wants, and it is. So we walk. She's not saying anything. I, I don't want to ask her questions. I've seen those conversations with kids and adults. The adults ask a question and the kid answers with one word answers. How was school? Fine. I don't want to do that. She's not saying anything, so I tell her about me, how I came to live here after living other places around the world. I tell a story I don't usually tell so that Sophia can get into a car with a person instead of a stranger. It takes a while. I buy us cones and we sit and drip and eat and wipe and after a while I stop because I feel stupid and we head back to the car. We stop at a corner and look both ways before we cross. She takes my hand, looks up. Yeah, blue, kind of a midnight blue. Everything changes, but nothing really changes. I go through my same life struggle. I just have to be at her school every day at 2.30 to walk her home. She brings me things for me to sign, homework and report cards and permission slips. She talks to her mother every day and sees her at least once a week, usually twice. And one day... She brings home a letter, sealed. I am very nervous. She's nervous. You didn't do anything, did you? She shakes her head. Sophia has an opportunity. There's a new program at a new school. She can go there and they have special classes. She has been selected. They just need my permission in order for it to go through my permission? When did it happen that they need my permission for something as important as this? I call the school. I am uppity. I am indignant. I am outraged. I'm an idiot. They've already talked to Dolly. They just need my permission because I'm the one who's going to have to get her to the bus every morning at 6 30 a.m. I attend a meeting about the program. <laughs> All the parents are there, and they're so excited. Their kids have been chosen. And they tell us about the school and the classes, and it's great. Yeah, but why don't they have those things at our school? But yeah, I'm glad she's been chosen. I'm glad she'll be challenged. Sophia takes the bus, and we're all there again half an hour early to pick up our kids. The kids are so excited, they're bursting when they get off the bus, even Sophia, who feigns indifference when it's just me, but she's not saying anything. I check my watch, and I figure that we can just pick up Dolly after her, her work before she goes to her night class. It's a great ride. I take us through, a drive through, and we buy the greasy food that we love, the two of them in the back seat, heads together. Sophia tells us her good news. She got called on. She knew the answers. And maybe she's going into the fourth grade section next week. They are so happy. The first thing I said to the agency guy was, why don't they both move in? No. Let Dolly focus on getting her degree. 
She just needs to know that Sophia is safe. Dolly. She's about the right age to be my youngest daughter, if you stretch reality a little bit. But we've come to kind of this peer relationship based on our mutual affection for Sophia. Maybe someday we'll be friends. But there's resentment goes along with all gratitude. We drop off Dolly and Sophia turns into her reticent self. She is when it's just us. But it's so obvious that I laugh. And I look in the rearview mirror, rear, rear mirror and she almost laughs too. A few days at the new school and Sophia makes a friend. This is the first time I've heard her talk about another child, and I am very curious, but ever wary of those one-word answers. I don't ask, I wait. And little by little, I hear about Jennifer. Jennifer is nine, and in the fourth grade class Sophia now attends. Jennifer lives in the neighborhood of the new school. Jennifer is beautiful. What's she look like? Her hair is fine. That's all I get. Sophia comes home with a sweater, I don't know. What's that? Jennifer. She can't give you her sweater. Her mother will get mad. No. Jennifer has a lot of sweaters, and she wants Sophia to have this one. Well, do you want to give her something in exchange? A glazed gaze I don't recognize, and then a sullen no. Great. Sophia doesn't think her stuff is nice enough to give. Well, do you want to bake some brownies that you can share? We do. Sophia, fascinated that I don't use a mix and furious that I haven't made them before. The brownies are a big hit. Mrs. Cabot, Jennifer's mother, calls me up. Sophia is invited. She's to come over for a play date after school on Friday. The girls will play, have dinner, and then Mrs. Cabot will bring her home. Sophia is standing right there. I can't say no, but this acceptance is fraught with anxiety for me. I'm worried she won't like the food. She didn't like anything I had. We ate McDonald's that first week. I, I worry that she'll answer in one-word sentences. I worry that something will be missing and Sophia will be blamed. I don't say any of this to Sophia, but I've been standing at the window for an hour when Mrs. Cabot drives her home at 7.30. She's in that car that the ads say, if you love your family, you'll put them in one of these. It's a horrible mustard color. I mean, why would you do that? If you can afford that car, you can afford a decent color. I don't know what's expected. Do I go out to the car? Does Mrs. Cabot walk her to the door? It doesn't matter. Sophia springs into the house, too excited to remember to be reticent. They have a house on the water and there's a boat and a dock, and they own it. And there's a big dog who has a house that sounds about as nice as ours. Sophia didn't like the steak, though. She likes her cow chopped and on a bun. That's my girl. School becomes about Jennifer. But Sophia keeps up with her classes, so no, I have no moral high ground from which to complain. A couple more play dates at the Cabots, and I decide that Jennifer has to come visit us. I call and leave my invitation on the Cabots answering machine, and yes, Mrs. Cabot says that she may come. This is for an overnight. I meet them at school on Friday. How do you do, Jennifer? The girls barely notice me, but continue their whispered conversation in the back seat. Jennifer and Sophia 
are a study in physical contrasts. Jennifer is tall where Sophia is small. Jennifer is pale where Sophia is dark. Jennifer's hair is blonde and thin where Sophia's is black and abundant. When Sophia had said her hair was fine, I didn't know she meant her hair was fine. We show Jennifer around. We are very nervous, but score. Jennifer loves the vegetable garden. We hoe and harvest for an hour. I let the girls wash off the mud and make the salad. Jennifer loves our tacos and refried beans. She's never had them. Jennifer goes to the bath bathroom. Sophia is beaming. Isn't Jennifer beautiful? It isn't a question, but yes, I say, she's very beautiful. Pained that if this is her standard of beauty, what does she think of herself? The time for pain passes as the little girls want to take the food waste to the worm bin. Eek and you, even from Sophia, who feigns indifference when it's just us. We are scoring in ways I never could have imagined. Jennifer thinks Sophia's room is awesome or rad or fabulous, something good. Her room, a couple of rainy weekends that Dolly had to study. We painted a rainforest on the walls and ceiling. It isn't subtle. It's a dream. That night, Jennifer gets out of bed to go to the bathroom. She's groggy. She asks me for a glass of milk and sits down next to me to drink it. Jennifer, we are so happy that you could come for a visit. Oh, yeah, she says. I couldn't wait. Sophia told me you were awesome. Sophia said I was awesome. Oh, I think Sophia is awesome too. Yeah, she says. Sophia is awesome. And so beautiful. I wish I was that beautiful. Oh. Oh. Jennifer, you are? You are.